In this video, I will be using the chemistry behind the 2021 Nobel Prize, which is asymmetric organocatalysis. In the year 2000, the two Nobel Prize winners independently discovered asymmetric organocatalysis. In this type of catalysis, small stable chiral organic molecules are used to catalyze a reaction, as opposed to sensitive organometallic reagents. Most notably, the common amino acid L-proline is used in organocatalysis, along with its counterpart D-proline. The advantage of these catalysts is that they are easy and cheap to produce while still being very effective in producing enantiopure products, usually with 99% selectivity for one of the enantiomers. This discovery has been important for the development of pharmaceuticals, where usually one enantiomer of a molecule is the active ingredient, while the other enantiomer can harm you, which is one of the reasons why this development was so important. I will be targeting a pharmaceutically relevant molecule as well, which is this bicyclic enol. This molecule is a key intermediate in the synthesis of several relevant hormones. So let's see how organocatalysis works in practice. So to get started, I set up a flask with a stir bar, I attach a funnel, and add 100 grams of 2,5-dimethoxy tetrahydrofuran, which is the whole bottle. I then add 200 ml of deionized water. The mixture now has two phases, since these chemicals do not fully mix. So I move the flask to a heating mantle and start stirring strongly to bring them into full contact. I attach a condenser and then heat the mixture to 95 C. In this reaction, 2,5-dimethoxy tetrahydrofuran will hydrolyze to succinaldehyde and methanol. The reaction doesn't take very long, so I leave it for two hours. When I come back, the mixture is now homogeneous and doesn't separate into phases anymore. So the reaction is finished. I remove the condenser and then attach a short path distillation apparatus. I increase heating and insulate the flask with cotton wool and aluminum foil. At first, methanol and water distill over. I then pull a vacuum to distill over the remaining methanol and some of the water. When the methanol is gone, there is still water remaining in the flask. So to get out all of the water and completely dry out the succinaldehyde, I add 100 ml of toluene to the flask and distill that over as well. Toluene and water will form an azeotrope that distills off together. This way, I can pull out all of the water more easily. It can also be tracked by seeing the cloudy distillate. I repeated the process of toluene addition and distillation two more times, and at the end, only pure toluene was coming over. I pulled a vacuum to make sure all of the toluene was gone and succinaldehyde started distilling over afterward. So I swapped the receiving flask to collect it. I also put a dry ice acetone bath under the receiving flask to prevent the pure succinaldehyde from polymerizing. I let it run until all of the succinaldehyde has come over and afterward I am left with 27.54 grams of solid succinaldehyde, which is a yield of 42.3%. Succinaldehyde is a liquid at room temperature, but it's still very cold from the dry ice acetone bath so I allow it to come back to room temperature. When that is done, I can start with the next step. So I set up a 1 liter flask and add in all of the now liquid succinaldehyde. I move the flask to a stir plate and add a stir bar, and then add 400 ml of ethyl acetate to the flask. I now set it in a heating mantle to keep it around room temperature, since it can get quite cold here. I then add 750 mg of the organocatalyst and common amino acid L-proline. I then stopper the flask and leave it to stir at room temperature for 45 hours. Since the discovery is about organocatalysis, I will explain this reaction more in depth. So in this reaction, the reaction is started by the formation of an enamine from a succinaldehyde aldehyde group and the amine from L-proline. The carboxylic acid from L-proline is able to interact with another succinaldehyde molecule through hydrogen bonding. The enamine double bond is then able to attack the carbonyl from the other succinaldehyde. This molecule then gets hydrolyzed by water to form the dimer of succinaldehyde. If we rotate the bonds of this molecule and redraw it, we get this structure. This molecule is able to form a hemiacetal through the reaction of its own alcohol and aldehyde group. So these molecules will be in equilibrium, where the hemiacetal is disfavored in non-acidic conditions. While this reaction is ongoing, I will prepare the second catalyst for the reaction, which will simply complete it to form the desired product. So I set up a small flask, and add in 20 ml of anhydrous diethyl ether. I then set the flask in an ice bath to cool it down. The first part of this catalyst is thiomorphaline. So here I have a small bottle of thiomorphaline, and of that, I add 1 ml to the diethyl ether. Now the second part is trifluoroacetic acid. So I made a solution of trifluoroacetic acid in 10 ml of anhydrous diethyl ether, and gradually add that to the thiomorphaline solution. In this reaction, 
the thiomorphalin and trifluoroacetic acid will simply react to form thiomorphalodium trifluoroacetate, which precipitates out of solution as a white solid. Now the next step is to simply remove it from the solution. So I set up a funnel and add in a filter paper. I then filter all of the mixture to collect the precipitated product. I take the filter with the product and scoop it into a crystallizing dish. Since it is still wet with diethyl ether, I let it sit in the air so that most of it will evaporate. After about 30 minutes, I moved it to a flask and pulled a vacuum on it for a few hours to pull out all of the remaining ether. Afterward, I was left with a dry white powder. Now I come back to the reaction flask and it has been 45 hours. The mixture has turned red and the first reaction should be finished. Now to continue with the next reaction, I first dilute the mixture with 450 mL of ethyl acetate. Then I add 1.41 grams of the catalyst thiomorphalodium trifluoroacetate and heat the mixture to around 65 C. In these conditions, the hemiacetal form of the intermediate is favored, both through the slightly acidic conditions and through consumption of the hemiacetal intermediate. The two aldehydes will undergo a typical aldol condensation, catalyzed by the thiomorphalodium trifluoroacetate, of which the product is a bicyclic enol. After two hours, the reaction should be finished, and the mixture has turned black. I turn off the heat and then add in 50 grams of wet silica gel. The silica assists in the decomposition of remaining succinaldehyde and binds polymers that may have formed. I let it cool down to room temperature and stir it for several hours. When I come back, the mixture looks the same, and I can now remove the silica. So I set up a Buchner funnel with a paper filter and filter the mixture through while pulling a vacuum. All the silica is blocked by the filter and it has become orange brown. I then wash the flask and the silica thoroughly with 500 mL of ethyl acetate. When that is done, I am left with a large volume of black filtrate which I will have to wash. So I set up a beaker with about 450 ml of water and started stirring. I then add 60 grams of sodium sulfate to make a sodium sulfate solution of about 12% by weight. And I just leave it to stir until everything has dissolved. I then come back to the black filtrate and separated it into two equal portions. So to the first half, I add a stir bar and start stirring. I then add half of the sodium sulfate solution. I leave it to stir for 10 minutes and repeat the same process with the other half of the filtrate. When that is done, I move it all to a separatory funnel and separate the layers. Then I add the water layer back into the separatory funnel and extract it thrice with some ethyl acetate. I then discard the water phase and combine all of the organic phases. I am then left with an even larger volume of the dark solution. I add a bunch of magnesium sulfate to both the solutions to dry it and then filter it all through some cotton directly into a flask. I then set the filtered up for short path vacuum distillation to remove all of the solvent. Since I am using a 1 liter flask, I occasionally added in the remaining part of the filter that didn't fit. After some hours, nothing more comes over and I am left with a thick dark oil. To remove any remaining bit of solvent and succinaldehyde, I pull a strong vacuum on the flask and heat it lightly. We see some stuff bubbling out and afterward, I am left with an even thicker dark oil. Now I add in 25 mL of DCM and shake it until everything has dissolved. Now to separate the components, I will do flash column chromatography. So I set up a beaker and weighed out 150 grams of spherical silica gel. I then wet the silica with 75 mL of water and stir it with a spoon until no more chunks are present. Now I set up a column with a funnel and add in all of the wet silica gel. I then put a layer of sand on top and start adding in all of the product that I dissolved in the DCM. I wash the flask and the sides of the column with a little bit of DCM and let it all soak into the silica. I then pour about 500 mL of the eluent on top, which is 50% ethyl acetate in hexanes. I attach a gas adapter to the top of the column and attach that to the exhaust of a vacuum pump. Now when I turn on the vacuum pump, it will blow air into the column and increase the air pressure. This will force the solvent to go through the column faster and speed up the separation. We can visually see the components separating and at first the very polar components are coming off. The first component is some green impurity. I continue to let the column run and wait for my product to start coming over. When the product started coming over, I changed the eluent to 75% ethyl acetate in hexanes. Beforehand, I have already prepared a staining solution to test the TLCs for the presence of my product. In this case, I needed a P and azaldehyde staining solution. So I set up a beaker with a stir bar and added 150 mL of ethanol. I then added 5 mL of concentrated sulfuric acid 
and 1.5 mL of glacial acetic acid. And as the final ingredient, I added 3.7 mL of P anisaldehyde. With this staining solution, I can visualize the desired product and many side products. The acid and the P anisaldehyde react with the product and impurities to generate a conjugated compound, which are colored and can therefore be seen on the plate. Anyhow, I let the column run for a good while and tested the black oil from the reaction mixture and some of the fractions that came off the column. As we can see on the left, there are many different spots from the large amount of side products. But with the column, we can remove most of them and get the product relatively cleanly in the fractions. When the column is finished, I combined all the fractions that should contain my product and distilled off all of the solvent with short path vacuum distillation. When that is done, I am left with a dark solid. I forgot to film it, but I transferred it all to a smaller flask and start dissolving all of it in boiling hot toluene. When it started boiling, I removed it off heat and it looked like everything had dissolved. I then set it in the freezer at minus 26 C and left it for a day. When I come back, a solid has crystallized out of the toluene. Now to remove all of the toluene, I first filter it through a Buchner funnel with a paper filter, but the solid is stuck at the bottom. So I move the flask to a heating mantle and heat it lightly while pulling a strong vacuum to remove all of the toluene. I come back an hour later and the powder looks dry. I then put all of the powder in a vial and the total yield of the product turned out to be 3.46 grams, which is 14.12%. Mine is a little bit darker than the picture from the literature, but they mentioned this would happen if the column was done with a gradient. I wanted to send this sample in for purity and enhanced purity analysis, but unfortunately, the companies I contacted were booked full. As a final analysis, I ran a TLC, and we can see the product is present, but also some impurity. Despite this impurity, it is still usable as a precursor for the synthesis of various hormones, since it will simply be removed later. So that was it for this video. Let me know if you think that the discovery of organocatalysis deserved a Nobel Prize. And with that, I would like to thank you for watching. And if you think I need a road of app, you're right. And you can become a patron to help me get it. See ya.